Good morning. Hi, I'm Drew. Um, so, a bit about me. Um, a quick rundown, as Kim said, I've done a heck of a lot over the time. So, previously I've been involved in auditing international hotel chains, specifically uh, PCI DSS and information protection and privacy assessments. Uh, I've now had a bit of a change around, so I'm more playing in the infrastructure, technology, project management space. Uh, but I'm more, I'm not a techie, I more specialise and work in the uh, policies and practices and procedural uh, segmentation. I try to deal with the management, uh, the C-suite, etc. So basically, I handle the boring stuff. That allows the uh, technical guys to get on to the fun stuff. So I allow the developers to get on with developing and the networking guys to get on with reading Dilbert cartoons. Uh, so today we're going to have a brief rundown on visual hacking. So we're going to go through and define actually what is visual hacking, a bit of a refresh on what information actually is. We've spoken a lot about information yesterday and today, but let's have a quick refresh on what that actually is. Um, 2017, just how vulnerable are we to this? It's quite an old um, mythology. Uh, We'll go through how it actually works, the mindset of any attacker, and we'll look into some mitigation strategies, a lot of which uh, you'll find being common sense, and there may be some there that, has an, that may be new information to you as well. Okay, so visual hacking. What actually is it? Put very basically, it's the act of gathering information or credentials by visual means. And essentially it is the world's oldest form of hacking. Ever since there were three people and two wanted to hide something and they could write it down, the third person has been wanting to find out what that information is. Uh, but as we'll go through, this is much more than just shoulder surfing. Everyone knows about shoulder surfing. This is much more involved than that. Visual hacking is a key component of internal vulnerability assessing. Spy agency field work, corporate espionage, any scenario where there is a desire to gather information without the risk of a digital footprint. So that we're not leaving any breadcrumbs in networking infrastructure and firewalls, etc., because we're not touching them. Uh, visual hacking can be used on its own or as part of a wider, more targeted, structured hacking campaign. So let's... Like I say, let's have a quick refresh on the word information. Uh, what are the types of information there are? You know, there's a lot of different styles out there. And for us, from a business perspective, from an infosec perspective, we need to be aware of the potential ramifications to a business if certain information is stolen, hacked, made public, uh, provided to a direct competitor, etc. So. We need to have that understanding of what information actually is and what our information that we deal with in our businesses actually is. So, quick rundown. We've got general information. This is information that if it made its way into the public domain, we don't really care. It's probably actually already out there. This is the information that may be on your corporate website. It may be previously reported in the media do we really care about whether someone has intruded our systems to get this information? Well, we're concerned that they've got into our networks or our facilities, do we, but we don't care that the information has been released because it's already in the public domain. Critical or sensitive information. This is information pertaining to aspects of the business that can be embarrassing or detrimental to the business. Um, if it gets made public or provided to competitors, etc. Yeah, we're talking about financial statements, customer client lists, things along that line. So it's embarrassing, it's detrimental, but in the long run, the company will recover. It's not going to, it's not end game for a business. So we are worried about critical and sensitive information, so we do need to bear it in mind. Confidential and proprietary information. This is information that can be 
legally binding, uh, central and critical to the business, and highly, highly sensitive. This is the kind of data that has the potential, and I stress the word potential, uh, to collapse or reversibly damage a business if made public. So let's think along the lines of the supposedly secret recipe for Coca-Cola. Colonel Sanders, X number of herbs and spices, whatever they're claiming to have this, uh, today. Um, environmental uh, patents, acquisition and merger documents and negotiations. Um, this is the sort of stuff that, if it is made public, is extremely damaging to a business. Uh, PCI DSS and PII data generally also falls under confidential proprietary uh, information. So we won't go too in depth with these ones. So payment card industry is info which contains facets outlined by the PCI Security Council and pertains to the processing, storage and transmission of credit card data. Businesses that handle payment gateways or large volumes of credit card information know PCI DSS all too well and they know how dreary and painful it is. And as we uh, had discussions on yesterday, uh, PII information, it's critical aspects of a person's identity. So anything that can be used to sell your identity, compromise your identity. Um, now, there is, of course, the government defence categories of information, secret, top secret, traffic-like protocol and the likes, but most of us here won't have exposure into that, so we won't go too far in depth. Uh, but most visual hacking attempts are targeted towards the critical, sensitive, and very much on the confidential, proprietary uh, side of the information spectrum. It is up to an individual business to classify what their information is. So the business owners and information owners need to have an understanding of what information they have and they store and how they handle that and how they classify that in order for us as InfoSec to adequately protect that information. But we're talking about visual hacking here. It's 2017. Just how vulnerable actually are we? You know, we're living in this new age of mobility with modern video conferencing technologies, uh, internet capabilities. From a business perspective, international borders are a thing of the past. Uh, corporations are you know, truly multinational entities. Uh, and the world is more focused on technical related security and countermeasures than pretty much any other time in history. That means we're actually now more susceptible to visual hacking techniques than we were, for example, at the height of the Cold War, where we've got all of the uh, spy movies and everything like that that puts the fear into to people. And why is this? Well, there's a multitude of reasons, really. First off, the line between work life and personal, office space and home, it's more blurred than ever. How many of us are leaving the office and continuing to work on the bus on the train, airport, home, pub, uh, wherever we may be. We have more and more portable devices that have the storage capacity and or connectivity capabilities to essentially mean that we've always got our entire office at our fingertips wherever we may be. Um, and that means there is a defined risk to sensitive information in a numerous number of environments that are outside the control of the business. Uh, but visual hacking targets more than just business information. At a personal level, individuals, me, you, everyone here, are prime and generally much easier targets. Um, we're putting more of our lives online, um, our movements, our relationships, job grievances, on an increasing list of social media platforms, and you know, we've all heard now of the nomophobia. We've got to make sure these devices are with us. We can't not have our mobile phone there. Um, how confident are you that no one's actually looking over your shoulder at what you're looking at? Uh, but again, it's uh, 2017. So I'm sure if someone was uh, 
acting suspiciously in our office, uh, looking over our shoulders at our computer screens. We get, we're we're going to notice, aren't we? Well, recently in America, the Ponemon Institute conducted a visual hacking experiment. Now, this was sponsored by 3M uh, and basically involved a unknown agency or temp worker coming in and working at 3M for uh, approximately a week in one of their larger American offices. Uh, and they, although they're doing their temping duties, they were also, on behalf of the Institute, trying to gain uh, um, access to and locate information of interest uh, throughout the course of that without being, um, without being noticed. The success rate that that uh, temp worker had of locating information, 88%. That's huge. 20% of that information was later deemed to be confidential or proprietary or highly sensitive. An average of five pieces of sensitive information was obtained in less than 15 minutes. 47% of that information was gathered from unattended desks, printers, resource rooms and rubbish bins. And, es and the truly scary part is an estimated 70% of these successful hacks were believed to have been witnessed but not reported. This means that 70% of the visual hacking was not stopped by the first line of defence, which is your employees. But, OK, look, I can admit, yeah, familiarity we may be getting complacent in the office, but we're all mindful of our surroundings in public, right? Uh, Iron Mountain, another great um, storage and security company, they released some research they conducted in Europe, and that highlights just how prevalent shoulder surfing really is. So they focused in on public transport in the UK, and as I'm sure we can uh, guess, it was shown that, well, a number of commuters are actually looking over the shoulder of the person next to them. But that percentage? Still pretty scarily high. One in five UK commuters have seen someone else's confidential or highly sensitive information by sitting next to them on a train, on a bus, etc. And hey, let's get back to the uh, corporate espionage example I used before. 20% of, in UK, 20% of director level staff find the airport business lounge fertile ground for information gathering. So, that's uh, pretty concerning again. So, how does visual hacking actually work? Uh, like any form of information gathering, uh, visual hacking takes a lot of practice and attention to detail in order to succeed. The true skill comes with the ability to identify targets of interest and absorb the information on the fly. Now, look, we're not talking about you know, camera in the bow tie, uh, phone in the shoe sort of stuff here. We are talking about trained skim readers who have the ability to absorb critical information, commit it to memory, and then carry on with sus supposed normal duties, um, often all in a time frame ranging from, well, you know, no more than a glance to 10, 15 seconds. So they've got to be very accurate, very fast, and not be noticed. But the actual method how to do it can be summed up quite easily with a simple action and question statement. So although outwardly I'm performing some designated duty or I'm walking through a space to a defined location, nothing suspicious there. However, internally I have the statement running through my head. I take a step. What can I see? Should I be able to see it? Yes? Ah, then I'm not worried about it. No interest. 
So I take another step. What can I see? Oh, how familiar is this? Someone's got their password stuck on, a, on their monitor or on their desk or some other place that's truly and that is easily visible. Now, yes, I know your password is not a true form of information considering the definitions we gave earlier, but it is still valuable information if the visual hacking is actually part of a wider automated campaign. If we're able to harvest some credentials, that makes the uh, process a bit easier for, some, for the rest of the campaign. I take another step. What can I see? Oh, we've got print stations with uncollected documents. Interesting to know what some of that information is. Resource rooms are an absolute gold mine. It's one of the few locations you can pick up someone else's document and give it a cursory glance and not raise any suspicions. Oh, sorry, I thought that was my job. And let's go back to the agency worker that we spoke about before and the uh, Ponemon experiment. Let's think about the kind of work given to many agency temp staff. It is often menial tasks, high volume printing or scanning. So this means a lot of justified room in an environment which has a lot of exposure to sensitive information. It's either left unclaimed on a printer or in the actual material they've been tasked with printing and scanning. Something to bear in mind next time we're going, oh, let's just bring in some temp resourcing to uh, handle our file and print um, migrations. I take another step. What can I see? Unattended desks with visible papers, bank statements, legal documents, strategic company directives, patent applications, everything you don't want made public, really. And don't forget about the rubbish bin. Um, often quite lots to be found thrown in the bin, especially towards the end of the day. I take another step. My personal favourite, unattended workstations that have been left unlocked. One of the absolute PCI and InfoSec cardinal sins. Yet I see this in every single company that I audit. Every day. And you won't believe what people leave open on their desktops when they walk away. So let's look at what is their mindset. So let's be realistic here. You know, visual hacking in an office is not going to yield anything close to the volume of data that a remote APT um, attack could collect. It requires a person on site and it just doesn't scale. Um, try sitting in someone's office space for 200 plus days and collect information like a remote attacker. Uh, visually recording 60 million items of data. It's not going to happen. But try being in someone's office space for a couple of days with a defined goal of gaining information on, I don't know, a particular legal matter that the, is going on that has the potential to disrupt the business if accurate allegations were uh, made public and put in the media. Now we're in the realms of potential and becomes worth the effort. So it's quantity versus quality. Of small amounts of high value information, a visual hacking campaign is very useful for surgical targeted attacks all about the quality of the info. Now look, this is all good and well for the uh, office and corporate environment, isn't it? But what about the outside world? What about you and me? What about the shoulder surfer on the train? They actually only want small amounts of information. Generally only for a couple of purposes. So they're not targeting your business stuff, they are targeting you individually. And what's their uh, mindset? What are they wanting to achieve? Well. Blank mile is a big one. Uh, how much is it worth to have the phrase, I know you are having an affair, go away? And how did they discover that, looking over your shoulder? Um, 
The other scenario, gotcha. This is that whole private eye scenario where the wife suspects the husband of something and sets the wheels in motion of trying to prove it. So, again, you never know who is looking at your device, no matter where you are sitting, and stop and think about some of the information that you have up on that device while you are sitting on the train, on the bus, in this room, for example. Let's start talking about some of the mitigation. So, visual hacking is a non-tech based attack, so we need a non-tech based defence strategy. In old money, this is known as operational security. Now, there's a lot of change of thought out there and a lot of different opinions, but I, I firmly believe myself that the foundations of InfoSec, CyberSec, network security, all of the really juicy stuff out there, the foundation is in a solid operational security. I fail to see how a firewall, how an IDS, IPS, network perimeter defences can be truly successful if they're implemented on a foundation of shoddy OPSEC. I just don't see how it is going to work. Uh, now, as a lot of people here who know me know, I can speak for hours on the topic of operational security and all the various facets of it, but I'm only just, today I'm just focusing on how it pertains to visual hacking there. But, so in this case, the most important uh, facet of OPSEC is operative development. Um, and in our cases, the operatives are our users. So this, we're starting to get into the realms of user development here. Now, yesterday, Declan from CERT gave a fantastically brilliant rant on users and the challenges of training them, making justified decisions, etc. And I agree with everything he said there 100%. Um, however, when it comes to OPSEC and developing an overall culture of awareness of what is happening in a workspace, I've got a little bit more faith, as long as we include ourselves in the practice and not looking in from the outside. InfoSec professionals have got, we can't keep rolling our eyes at the word user. We need to be proactive and work with our users to create solutions that work for them and the business. If users understand the problem that we are trying to resolve and they understand the solution to that problem, they are extremely likely to adhere to that solution. If they don't understand the problem or we make the solution too difficult, they will not adhere to it. They will find bypasses or workarounds. Now, there's a lot of examples I can use here. I'm going to pick on the low-hanging fruit, so let's focus in on passwords. Um, so let's wake everyone up on a Saturday morning. A quick show of hands. How many people here are work in an environment that enforces complex passwords? Uppercase, lowercase, alphanumeric, special characters, yep. Now keep your hands up if you are 100% certain there is no user-related password issues. No one has them written down on a little post-it note, or hidden under the keyboard, or at the back page of a diary, etc. All the likely scenarios. Now here's the interesting thing, um, even a gent by the name of Bill Burr, go back a while, he was the gent who first published the dire need for complex passwords. He's now come out and said they do not work. By making the requirements too difficult for our users, they are finding workarounds. So they're keeping them written down or they keep the same password and just advance the number at the end by one for four cycles and then they revert back to the original password. Starting to sound familiar to anyone? So how do we as InfoSec work in with our users to make this process easier for them while still maintaining the integrity of our networks? 
Well, there's lots of other options out there. There's lots of different things. One of the big ones at the moment that I personally quite like is a pass phrase over a password. Generally a lot easier for a user to remember. Um, so, yeah, and they're sitting there, well, how am I going to remember a passphrase? What's the opening line to your favourite song? Here's a great passphrase to start off with. Okay, most of our systems require us to put a number or something in there, but it is easy for our users to remember. We're getting them involved in the thought process. Still a struggle for a user to remember. We've all got one of these users in our organisation, someone that just cannot remember the time of day, they can't remember to go to the toilet without being told. They need to have it written down and we've beaten our heads on the desk till it's black and blue trying to get it through their head. We still need to work with these users to get a solution in place that works for them and the business. So, what can we do? Let's use visual techniques ourselves. Um, Every desk has some form of generic memo, form, flyer, advertisement, company statement stuck on it. And that is of no value to anyone. The information is completely benign. But the first four words of row six actually still makes a fantastic passphrase and it's something that they can then remember. I'm still not advocating the thing of having passwords written down because it's an absolute cardinal sin but if it helps our users as a workaround, well, it, does, it builds that relationship. And obviously with passwords, two-factor is still the preferred, but not all businesses are ready to commit at this, to that strategy at this point in time. Um, what else is there with OPSEC? So, look, we're focusing on actions that prevent the spread of information outside our perimeter of controls. So what else can we focus on? Let's do print assessments. If I have a confidential proprietary document and that is saved in a file repository, I have a single instance, one instance of that document that I have to protect. Okay, admittedly a file repository is a bit more complex to protect and I'm not gonna get into UACs and all the other bits and pieces today, but it is still a single instance to protect. If I print the document, I now have two instances I need to protect and I need to start considering disposal options. If I make this document available to everyone in my office space and they all print it, I now start to lose knowledge of how, much, how many instances I have to protect and it's very hard to protect something you don't know exists. So now we're going to more user development. Back to the cultural shift. Does it need to be printed? If yes, what are you going to do with it once it is printed? Where is it going to be stored? Going back to my auditing days, remember that a locked filing cabinet with a key still hanging out of it is not a secure location. Now, and with printing, while there are some, can be some technical security concerns if they're not configured correctly, uh, follow me style print management is a strong mitigation strategy to follow me print because from an OPSEC, OPSEC perspective it ensures that there are no unattended, uncollected documents at a print station to be um, viewed. Let's talk about some secure disposal methods. Uh, as soon as a printed document makes its way into a public space including a dumpster, a skip, outside the secure perimeter of your building, it is classified as being in the public domain and you lose all rights to the information held on that document. It has been placed into the public by your business. So you want to make sure it's in an unreadable, in an unreadable state before it leaves your premise. So how? We've got cross-cut shredding, now I emphasise cross-cut. Anyone familiar with, say, the Watergate incident or the sacking of the US Embassy in Iran uh, will know that straight shredding is actually relatively easy to reassemble and still get access to the information there. Uh, the other main way of handling disposal is incineration. And there are both, for both of these options, there is in-house and third-party options that can be investigated 
if you want to put uh, their onus of responsibility there onto a third party. So, look, we are not simply training users. As was mentioned yesterday, and as I'm going to reiterate, um, training gets forgotten. Training is used to tick a box with HR. It's just going through the processes. We're talking about user development, specifically user culture development, developing a culture of awareness of what is going on in the office space, a culture where asking simple questions like, does this need to be printed? Should this item be visible? Who is this person walking around my office space? Making that culture so that asking those questions is not enforced but second nature. Now this is one of the best mitig mitigative strategies you can have against visual hacking. Oh, sorry, we've also got things like privacy screens that we can put on monitors, etc. Um, but look, aside from the human factor, there are some premise level strategies that can also be used uh, as a defensive, me uh, defensive measure. This is a term you, not many people may have encountered before, some of you may, CPT or Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Now this is primarily focused on physical security, but there are some concepts that cross into OPSEC. So CPT refers to design strategies that are used to deter an intruder from attempting to break in or access a building, and often these are deterrents that are built in at a subconscious level. So examples overall would be planting hedgerow, setting up bench seatings, installation of signage, that all looks like standard practice but is actually specifically designed to subconsciously direct people onto a designated pathway, which in turn is monitored by hidden CCTV. So you are subconsciously directing people who are coming onto your grounds to follow the path that you want them to follow and not to go off on their own tangent. At night, it uses lighting zones, clearly visible CCTV, barricades, etc., to again subconsciously direct people uh, into the areas that you want them in and not the parts not approaching the building from areas you don't want them in. So if you've got access to the buildings where there may be doors, you have large areas of bright lighting in front of that so that you cannot be not approach an access point unseen. But how does that relate to visual hacking? Um, that's where it comes in to once someone is inside your building. Now that's where crime prevention through environmental design can offer you protection and providing guidance on your office layout. Now this has got a somewhat um, obscure name of a work styles assessment. So what does that actually mean? So, the way every office it seems to be going at the moment, let's have another show of hands here. Um, who here works in an open plan office? Yeah? How much thought do you really think went into the layout of that office? A lot? Not a lot? Zip? I'm seeing a lot of uh, zeros being held up here. So, a work style assessment will look at the proposed floor plate of an office space and will then survey each individual and department working in that space. This assessment will be asking questions such as, are you primarily office or desk based? Does your job role require you to do a lot of printing? Do you attend a lot of meetings? Do you spend all day at your desk? Do you have a lot of small one-on-one -on -one huddle sessions at your desk or at some soft furnishings, you know, two or three people at a soft couching area near your desk? Um, are there proposed breakout spaces on the floor plate? What level of sensitive information do you handle on a daily basis? Now, the results of the survey will then provide some guidance on where 
people are best situated to seat within that floor plate. This is going back to the environmental design and some in your operational security. So, hey, you're a field worker. You spend a lot of your time actually out of the office making sales calls, out in the field, doing whatever it is that you're required to do. So, you get a desk close to the door so not to disturb others with all of your comings and goings. Sorry, you don't get a window seat, don't need it, no matter how much you want it, bad luck, this is the location that's best suited to your working style, and we're going to give the nice window seat to someone that's a bit more desk bound for the course of the day. If you're a high volume printer, then you get located closer to the printers, to the resource rooms, to the print stations. The same principle applies for those with regular meetings, have them close to meeting rooms. So, defensive strategy for those who are most likely to be targeted by a visual hacker based on the level of information that they handle, we could look for a desk that is distant from the entry points, seated with their back to a wall, not back into the remainder of the office, or even worse, a window. Um, not seated in high traffic areas, high foot traffic areas. Uh, not near the meeting rooms or breakout spaces or soft furnishings, etc. Have them essentially, we are aiming to place targeted users in locations where a visual hacker has no reason to approach them or their workspace unless they are directly speaking to the target. And the more complex the floor plate, the better defence is provided. So by having users of uh, high sensitive information kind of huddled away where they're harder to approach, it is making them more secure just by the environment they are sitting in. So, a little bit tricky to see, hopefully we can make it do here. So this is actually one of the projects I've been recently working on. Um, so how would I be working it here? So I've got main entrances and thoroughfares starting. I've got stairways here, stairways here. So that's going to be high thoroughfare areas. I have a resource room just here. So that's going to have a high foot traffic area because these got lots of people walking in and out. I have meeting rooms down the middle of the building which I know are glass fronted. Again, not a good location around them. I have a lot of areas, whoop, where am I? Where I've got soft furnishings, little huddle breakout tables, uh, map layout areas, etc., etc. So these are the sort of areas that I would specifically be aiming to avoid. So if I'm focusing on this floor plan, I would be taking all this into example and I'd be looking more closely down here. Let's zoom it up a little bit. So, first thing I'll be doing is just rotating these desks around. I know these are solid walls, so I'll be having the station so that the back is to the wall and not to the remainder of the office. But I also know I am distant from the high foot traffic areas, from the entrances, and as an added bonus, I also have these structural barricades here. So this area here would be a great location to have people who have got, who regularly handle this confidential sensitive styles of information. So what I'll do is we will wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Um, I will open up if anyone does have any further questions that I can assist with. For those who didn't hear, the question was actually what is the uh, the highest level or the, the riskiest data that I've, been, that I've personally encountered as being exposed when I've done being involved in these auditing. Um, probably the most high risk thing that I've encountered is not so much from the visual aspect, but it was uh, it did involve some technical stuff where. I was auditing a property that will remain nameless that handled high volume credit card information where they'd recently gone through a 
infrastructure refresh. And I was walking around, I was doing the full premise investigation, and I found a server sitting at the loading dock that was set to be going off for um, off site for scrap metal. I actually powered this back on and found that there had been no formatting or wiping done, and it was the payment gateway, the previous payment gateway server that hooked all of the interfaces through to uh, the intermediary, intermediary facilities for handling credit card payments. So it had a lot of logs, a lot of uh, secure hashes, all of the work was still load there, and that was all set to go offsite. So that's probably the uh, most immediate and biggest concern that I've encountered. Have you had any luck pushing back against open plan officers on the basis of security? I mean, we know open plan officers are cheap, right? Has it actually been successful making the security argument in favour of actual doors or things like that? Um, it's a double-sided uh, question because the more doors that you have, or my experience would tell me that the more offices that you have or the more enclosed areas you have, the more lackadaisical people become with the operational security. Oh, I've got an office space here, so I don't need to clean my desk, I don't need to worry about um, locking my workstation, etc. And just because it's an office space, it doesn't stop people having the requirement to walk in there to deliver documents, to deliver bits and pieces. So my personal experience has actually been that those working in an open plan office are more likely to focus in on that whole um, security focused culture um, and the unfortunate side of it is from a business perspective is generally it comes down to the dollars and cents and it is cheaper to implement open plan than it is to put up a bunch of walls so you need the security argument just when there's a lot of other facets you know hey, I'm putting in thousands of dollars into my firewall, I'm not going to also put in thousands of dollars to put in offices. It's the reality of it in the same age. So have you ever tried um, as a mitigation strategy just shaming people? And what I mean is one of the American offices I've dealt with my friends run is if they leave, if someone leaves a screen unlocked, they will try to they will get onto that desktop and they'll put a topless photo of David Hasselhoff <laughs> and then also send the same photo to the entire company. So do you try shaming people in maybe a fun way or maybe not fun way in order to try to get them to be more aware of what's going on? Um, I suppose that really, that kind of strategy really comes down to the nature of the business, doesn't it? Um, if you've got highly corporate and professional people that probably won't go down very well. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you've got you know, a good fun loving and a um, comfortable sort of environment, well, you may be able to get away with it. Um, generally, the main thing that I've uh, personally done on a regular basis is when I encounter, for example, an unlocked um, PC while I'm doing my rounds is I will lock it on their behalf, but I'll leave a uh, post-it note just stuck to the screen saying uh, friendly reminder or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I will be fair and say that has come back and bitten me on the one occasion, the single occasion that I've got to lock my workstation running out for a uh, meeting and someone left a post-it note saying PCI asshole on my desk. So. <laughs> Well, it is a case of what goes around comes around. So, I mean, uh, time to be done now. So, thank you very much for that and enjoy the rest of the day.